Uh, I just wanted to welcome anybody here for the first time, anybody who has um, come back for maybe the second or third time. It's so great to have you guys. Um, we've been in a series called Secret Sounds. Can we put that graphic? Oh, it's already up there. These guys are amazing. Give it up for our production team in the back. Amen. Yes, we've been in a series called Secret Sounds, and this series is all about the voice of God, hearing God speak. We believe that God spoke in the Bible. In fact, in the very first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we see within a couple of verses, the first thing that we see God doing is you see him speaking. He, the Bible says that he spoke, and there, things came to be. He created with his words, and we see him speaking to people all throughout the Bible, New and Old Testament, and we just still believe that God still speaks to us today. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about how God speaks to our heart. He speaks to us in secret. He speaks to us in ways that we're not used to. He doesn't speak to our ears. He doesn't speak to us oftentimes in, in words we can really understand. Sometimes he speaks in a feeling, in an unction. Sometimes he speaks in a thought. Sometimes he speaks through other people. We've talked about how God is really good at being heard. We've talked about how he not only knows what to say to you, but he knows how to say it so that it gets through to you. He's amazing. And, and the reason that he speaks is because he wants and desires intimacy and relationship with us. Amen? I'm so grateful for that. And so we've been talking about that. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about why all of this is important. Why should we care that God speaks to us? Why should we care that God still wants to talk to us today? Why should we try and do our best to be able to hear his voice? What, what are the reasons? Number one, his voice is spirit and life. Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. Peter says, when Jesus asked him, he says, are you going to forsake me too? Because he had just had a bunch of people walk away from him because he, they were offended by something that he said. Something that he said. Everybody say said. They were offended by Jesus' words. And many people left him and he said, Peter, are you going to leave me too? And he says, where else can I turn? You alone have the words of eternal life. And, and Jesus' voice is powerful and it's wonderful and he speaks to us in many, many ways. Well, I wanted to talk about fellowship, relationship with God tonight. In order to explain that and how that pertains to us hearing God's voice, I want to tell a story. Now, a couple, I say a couple years, it's more than a couple years. I was probably like maybe eight or nine years old, maybe even eight years old, I don't remember. I was a kid and, and me and my brother, Tony, uh, decided to take a walk through the woods. We used to live on Learnagle Road in, in North Ridgeville and our backyard had this fence next to it. And if you go through the fence to the left is just kind of like probably how many acres do you think it was of woods? Probably about 10 acres of wood. So to an adult, it wouldn't be very hard to navigate. To a nine-year-old, extremely hard to navigate. And my parents would always tell us not to go back there by ourselves. And so I went with my brother, which is equally stupid because he's younger than me. And he's not, you know, we're not in a very much better place than I was going by myself. And so we go back there, we go through the fence, and it's around dinner time, probably four or five o'clock. And so we get back there, we think we have plenty of time. So we keep walking, and we're just like, as long as I can still see the house, we're fine. And so we take a few steps, and we kind of look around, and we, went, we saw this, this tree fort that was back there a ways. And as long as we kept looking behind us to see that we could still see home, I would say home. As long as we could look behind us and still see our house through the trees, we would peek through the trees, and sometimes, you know, the farther away that we got, the harder we had to look. But as long as we could see our house, we were fine. We were cool. We weren't nervous. We weren't afraid. We were like, all right, as long as I could see it, I could find my way back. And so eventually we got so caught up and enamored in the things that we were finding, the animals and, and the trees and the, the tree house and these weird things we were finding on the ground and decapitated Barbies and just the most random stuff we could find. And so we, we forgot to look back for a while. We forgot to look back on where we were. And like I said, 10 acres doesn't seem like a lot, but to a nine-year-old, this is, this is pretty intense. And so it comes to a point where we're like, hey, we should probably turn around and see if we can still see our house. And we turned around, and no matter which way that we turned, we couldn't see it. And we thought, well, we would have been fine if we weren't turning in circles because we could have just turned around and walked straight back and found it. But we had been spinning around for so long trying to look for our house that we were completely disoriented. We couldn't see the road. We couldn't see our house. We couldn't see any houses. All we could see in either direction was trees. And I'm the older brother, and so I'm starting to act like I'm not about to pee myself. And I look at Tony, and I'm just like, relax, calm down, it's going to be okay. We're going to find mom and dad. You know, we're going to be fine. We're just going to keep walking in one direction. And, and this happened for a while, and it started to get dark. And it, and it started to get so dark that not only could we not see our house, but we couldn't hardly see 10 feet in front of us. And in the woods, it gets darker a lot faster. And so it was getting dark. I couldn't find home. It had been a couple hours since we were outside. And now I'm starting to panic. I can no longer hide the fact that I'm shaking from my little brother. And so I start to cry and he starts to cry and we're just like, mommy! And we're trying to scream out and get my parents' attention because we were so scared. We had walked so far away from home 
And eventually we walked and we kept walking, we kept walking, we found the street and we saw that my mom was outside in her van and that she had been calling for us the entire time. She was outside yelling into the woods, Tyler, Tony, Tyler, Tony, Tyler, Tony. And so we were so far away from them that we couldn't hear their voice. If we could hear their voice, we could have at least followed their voice to the general direction of where they were and we could have gotten to them and they could have taken us home and it would have all been fine. But we were so far away from them that we couldn't hear them. And so what I want you to know tonight is that when it pertains to our relationship with God, distance and in physical relationship with each other, distance creates deafness. If I'm close to somebody, I don't have to scream at them to hear me. Thank God, you know, Grace isn't just at home and I'm sitting across the table from her and I'm like, can you pass the ketchup? Because she's close, I don't have to scream. I could just, I could speak to her on a normal level. I can whisper to her because she's close. But the farther you get away, the more you have to shout. The farther you get away, the more you have to make yourself heard. You, the louder you have to get, the louder you have to raise your voice. And so because me and my brother were so far away from my mom and my dad, we couldn't hear them calling out our name. And the same things happens to us spiritually. Many times we go on this journey through the woods where we know we're not supposed to be. And we say, you know, as long as I can see home, I'm fine. As long as they don't wander off too far, as long as they don't go too far into sin, as long as I'm not having sex with my girlfriend, we're fine. We can do anything else. It's totally fine. There's no boundaries. As long as I can see home, as long as I'm not wandering too far off, I'll be okay. And then we get surprised when one day we wake up and we've drifted so far from where we began. We've drifted so far from our relationship with God that we can no longer hear his voice. And our heart becomes deaf because of distance. Everybody say distance. In the book of Exodus 19, verses 1 and 2, this is the passages. These are the passages, the next couple of verses we're going to be spending the most time on tonight. It says this. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, I think that's how you say it, I'm not sure. They entered the desert of Sinai. Everybody say desert. And then it says, they entered the desert and Israel camped there in the desert, in front of the mountain. So here we find the Israelites. These are God's chosen people. He was, these people were God's chosen vessel on who he was going to use to reveal who he was to the rest of the world. And so we find them camped in the desert, in front of the mountain. And you know, many times we find ourselves in a desert. What is a desert in our life? A desert is a place of dryness. It's a place of confusion. It's a place of hardship. Has any of you ever been in a desert season before? If your hand isn't raised, I'm sure you have, and you're probably just putting on a brave face, trying not to cry, thinking about it. But we all go through desert seasons, and the desert, you know, represents certain times in our lives. It represents times of loneliness, hardship, confusion, pain, times of difficulty. And the first thing I want to point out in this passage is that the Israelites were camped in the desert, but at the same time, they were camped in front of the mountain. And many times in the Bible, mountains represent the presence of God. And we're going to see why that they represent the presence of God, because later in this passage, we see that God descends with his presence in the form of fire on this mountain. And so throughout the Bible, we see that mountains represents the presence of God. And so we need to take after the Israelites. They were camped in the desert. Yes, they were in a season of their life that they didn't want to be in, that they were hoping wouldn't last very long. They were in a season of their life of confusion where they were wandering around and they didn't know what was going to come next and they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. And they were thirsty and they were hungry and they were complaining and they weren't in a place where they wanted to be. They were camped in the desert, but they were also at the same time camped in front of the mountain. And, and many times we find ourselves allowing the desert on the outside to infect our heart on the inside. What you need to know is that even though we all go through desert-like experiences, the dryness on the outside doesn't have to affect your soul on the inside. I'll explain. In John 7, verses 37 through 39, it says this. This is Jesus. Uh, a story about Jesus, which is amazing. I love Jesus. Then on the most important day of the feast, the last day, Jesus stood and shouted out to the crowds. All you thirsty ones, anybody in here thirsty? <laughs> Don't admit it. Don't admit it. Just keep it to yourself. Raise your hand nice and low so, you know, you and God can see. Jesus is talking to the thirsty people in this place. He says, all you thirsty ones, come to me. Come to me and drink. Believe in me so that rivers of living water will burst out from within you flowing from your innermost being, your soul, your heart, just like the scripture says. Verse 39 says, Jesus was prophesying about the Holy Spirit. Everybody say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the one that when Jesus died and resurrected, they sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. Jesus said that he was another one like him 
The Holy Spirit is just like Jesus. He says that he is supposed to be a counselor. He's supposed to be a comforter. He's supposed to be a teacher. He's the one that leads us into all truth. He's the one that lives in us, and the Bible says that he'll never leave us, that he's a friend until the end. We're talking about that Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit, the believers were being prepared to receive, but the Holy Spirit had not been poured out upon them yet because Jesus had not been unveiled in his full splendor, which means that he hadn't died on the cross, died for three days in a tomb, and then rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. Now, those are the things that precursored the outpouring of the Holy Spirit onto believers. And so the Holy Spirit was given to dwell in the innermost part of you so that you may be camped in a desert on the outside, but you have rivers of living water flowing on the inside. That you never have a ceasing of God's love, of God's mercy, of God's grace, of God's power, of his presence. There is a never-ending flow of his presence echoing on the inside of your heart that if you're willing to look inside, if you're willing to look in, if you're willing to look up, if you're willing to, to look to the Father, to look to the Holy Spirit, the desert on the outside doesn't have to infect you on the inside. Believers, many times Christians will say things like, I'm just in a dry season in my relationship with God. I'm not really feeling his presence very much. I just feel like I'm lost. Well, I personally believe that, that Christians have no excuse to be dry in their, spirit, in their spiritual life, in their walk with God, because how can someone with a river living inside of them be dry? How could somebody with a never-ending flow of the Holy Spirit ever have a dryness in their relationship with God? So I think that many times what we call a dry season or a desert season spiritually is, is most of the time it's, it's a distraction period. Many times it's believers getting distracted and devoting themselves to things that they shouldn't be devoting themselves to, even if it's something that seems harmless, because many times it is those things. It's not the things that you know that you're not supposed to be focused on. It's the little things. It's the texting. It's the, it's the Facebook. It's the scrolling. I, I'm, I'm amazed at how long sometimes I can sit in my bed in the morning and just scroll and scroll and scroll and just realize that like an hour's gone by. It's amazing the little things that will distract us and steal our devotion. And so we have no excuse to be dry in our relationship with God because our heart is overflowing and ever flowing with his presence, love, mercy, grace, and power. And nobody, not the devil in hell, no angel above, no thing present or in the future, not death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nothing in all of creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nobody can take that away from you. The Bible says that he is eternal life, and nobody can snatch you out of his hands. There's rivers of living water flowing within us. So even if there's not rivers of blessing and, and, and prosperity and, and good times and, and things worthy of celebration on the outside, you have something on the inside that instead of getting infected by the things that are happening around you, you can infect it with the rivers of living water. The Bible says that he brings rivers to dry wastelands. Now that's your responsibility. You've got the river flowing inside of you. You can infect other people that are dry. You can, you can send rivers, forceful rushing water of the Holy Spirit in his presence. You can send that stuff into your job. You can send that stuff into your home. You can send it into your family that don't believe. You can send it to your friends. You can, you can, you can infect the atmospheres around you because of the power that lives within you. Amen? So there's two types of distance that I want to talk about tonight because in the beginning we talked about how distance creates deafness. When we separate ourselves from God, there's a deafness. The louder he has to speak, the duller our, the ears of our heart are. And so there's two types of distance. The first type of distance is a distance that no human being could ever cross on their own. It's called the distance created by sin. Everybody say sin. Sin is disobedience to God. It's, the Bible says that every person in the universe has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means we all have this distance between us on the day of our birth. But the Bible says that God has eradicated and closed the gap, destroyed the distance created by sin by sending his son to die on the cross to forgive us, not only to forgive our sin, but to make it as if we have never sinned to cleanse not just our sinful past, but to cleanse our conscience so that we don't even have to think about what we used to be and who, the, who we used to be and what we used to think like and, and the people that we used to hang around and the things that we used to do. We don't have to think about that stuff anymore. The old is gone, it's passed away, and all things have become new in his name. And so God has closed the distance created by sin. That's God's part, but we have a part too. Because I don't know if you know this, but just because God has closed the distance created by sin doesn't mean that every person is close to God. And you can know that just by simply looking around you. What people turn to, what people resort to in times of hardship and crisis. 
you can tell that just because God has done his part in separating sin from your life and destroying that distance created by sin doesn't mean that we're close to God. So there must be another responsibility, and this is the second type of distance. It's a distance created by a lack of devotion. So we have the distance of sin, and then we have a distance of devotion. God has destroyed the distance of sin, and our responsibility is to make sure that our lives are fully devoted to him. Because the more that you devote of your life and your heart and your thinking and your ways, the more that you devote to God, the less distance spiritually there is between you. The, the, the more apt you are to hear his voice, the more sensitive you are to his presence, the more that you can feel his leading, no matter what's going on around you, no matter if people are screaming in your ear on this side and this side, you can hear God's voice on the inside because you are devoted. There's a distance of sin destroyed by the blood of Jesus, and there's a distance of devotion that is up to us to close. It's up to us to close that gap. The first one we couldn't do anything about, that's up to God, and all we have to do is accept that free gift of forgiveness. But the second one is totally up to us. It's how we spend our time. It's what we focus on. It's the things that we're willing to prioritize and put first. That second distance of devotion is up to us to close. And if you want to hear his voice, you have to get close to him. And if you want to get close to him, you have to be devoted to him. And if you want to get devoted to him, you have to start somewhere. You have to start here. You have to start now. The Bible says, don't be conformed to the things and the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a process. And thank God he's patient. Now in Exodus 19, verses 10 through 11, it says, and the Lord said to Moses, we skipped a couple of verses, uh, but it says this, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them, which means separate them from me. Consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Everybody say the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of all the people. And you know, one practical step that we can use to get closer to God is by making appointments. Appointments are, you can tell what a person values based on the appointments that they make in their life. Because when you make an appointment, you're saying yes to one thing and no to literally everything else. You know, in life, I, I forget a lot. And so I'm so thankful that God has given me a wife that is literally a human calendar. I, I literally say this all the time. I'm like, she is, I'm not kidding you when I say she is a human calendar. If I have something to do, there's some times where I didn't even tell her what I had to do, but she overheard it or heard it through the grapevine and she marks it down in her mind and she'll get to that day where I completely forgot what I had to do later that day. And she'll be like, don't forget, you have this going on with so-and-so and it's at this time and it's at this place. And I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you so much because I, I forget my appointments all the time. And so if I have to, if I have plans that I wanna make, I have to go to Grace. I have to go to her and, and she has to remember it for me and she reminds me, thank God, because even somehow the reminders on my phone don't, go, don't do a good enough job at reminding me. I guess that's just something I need to work on. But amen, she's a human calendar and it's wonderful. But making an appointment represents what we value. When we say yes to one thing, we have to say no to literally everything else that conflicts with that. It's an appointment to spend time alone with God in worship, in prayer, in the reading of his word. Because you make time for what you value. And I, I hear so many excuses from people that you know, they'll come to me and they'll ask me for advice or they'll ask another pastor for advice and they'll be like, what should I do? This thing is going on in my life and, and this is going on in my heart. I don't feel the presence of God and I'm, you know, I'm just worried all the time and I'm fearful and I'm, you know, this and that. And I'm just like, are you spending time with God? And they're like, oh, you know, I'm just so busy. Oh, you know, I just, I just man, my work schedule is so, my work schedule is insane. I just got back to school and my homework is due at midnight and I wait till the day of. And so if it's due by midnight, it means I do it at midnight. And all these things kind, kind of, crowd out God in their life and they wonder why their life tends to, to drift away from the purposes and the plans that God has for them. And so I hear these people say this all the time that I just, I just don't have time or I, I find it so difficult. But the reality is, is that no matter what it is, you make time for what you value. I promise you, if you really value something, how many times, guys, I'm talking to you for a second, how many times have you gotten into a new relationship and you're like crazy about this girl. And how many times have you canceled plans to hang out with her because you're just so excited, right? And how many times have you probably skipped things and ignored things that you probably shouldn't ignore and skip? Or you'll call off of work and pretend to be sick so that you can go and spend time with this person because you love that person so much. It's the same thing with God. If you really value your relationship with God, you make time for him. 
You make time for a devoted life to Jesus Christ. And if I were you, I would devote my life to him because, and I'm talking to myself too, if I were myself, it's the most valuable thing in the world because it's not just, we're not talking about 80 years on earth, we're talking about eternity after life. And if we don't value eternity, that's, that's a problem because you can't just drift your way into heaven. It doesn't work like that. And so, and that's not to say that you have to work your way into heaven either. It means that there's an active relationship between you and Jesus that you've given your life, you've given your faith, you believe in him, and you, you give him control of your life and you're living the way that he teaches us to live. And by grace, you're saved through faith. But it's important that we make time for what we value. It's important to, to make appointments with God. It's like set an alarm in the morning and no matter what's going on, get up, show up. And you might not feel something, you might not understand when you read the word of God, you might not you might get to the end of 10, 15 minutes, an hour, however long it is. You might get to the end and feel like you didn't really do anything or you didn't really accomplish anything, but that's not the point. Because your time with God is really not only about you to enjoy. It's, it's about God enjoying it too. God is a person, and many times we forget that. Many times we think God just wants a relationship with me so that he can fix me because I need him. But the reality is, is that this whole thing started with God's intense love for us, that the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God enjoys his time with you more than you could ever imagine enjoying it with him. God is so thankful when you show up to spend time with him because he adores you. Even when you're not thinking about you, he's thinking about you. Even, sorry, even when you're not thinking about him, he's thinking about you. When your mind is distracted, when your heart is devoted to other things, to other lovers, God is totally devoted to you. So much so that he proved it by giving his entire life. By being tortured and whipped and scorched and spit on and mocked. He did that because he, he was devoted to you. He did that because he wanted you. He desired you. He's a person. He has emotions. He has feelings. And he wants a relationship with you. In the verses we just read, we see God making an appointment with his people. He says, on the third day, I'm going to come down and meet with you. We don't see the Israelites taking initiative. We see God taking the first step. We see God saying, hey, I want to meet with you. I desire to be with you. I want to be your God. I want you to be my people. I want to be your father. I want you to be my children. I want friends. I'm coming down on the third day. I'm going to meet with you. So God makes time for what he values, which is his people. And we ought to do the same thing if we value our relationship with God. In Exodus 19, verses 12 through 13, it says, You shall set barriers for all the people. He's talking to Moses. This is God talking. You shall set barriers for all the people around the mountain, saying this, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch its border. Whoever touches the mountain must be put to death. No hand shall touch him. That is, no one shall try to save the guilty party, but the offender must be stoned or shot through with arrows. This doesn't really sound like God wants to be close. He'll be shot through with arrows, whether a man or animal that touches the mountain, he shall not live. But when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then they shall come up the mountain. So the Bible says that anyone who touched the mountain without God's permission first was to be put to death because of sin. But we know that when Jesus came, he was put to death so that we could touch God. In the Old Testament, in this story, they're put to death because they touched God. In the New Testament, we see Jesus was put to death to death before so that we could come to him blameless without sin and touch God for ourselves and have relationship with God for ourselves. Because of sin and because he's such a holy God, he had, the, the holiness of God would destroy these people if they weren't without sin and everybody is with sin. And so if God didn't first erase the people's sin, he could never have relationship with us. And that's why he sent his son. And that's what his strongest desire is, his strongest desire in the universe. He could literally have or create anything. The one thing that he cannot force or, or bring upon himself simply by speaking it is a relationship with you. That's our choice. He has stepped forward first. He gave up the sacrifice. He gave up his life. He died and rose again. He did everything necessary so that you could come to him freely at any time of your life. In the time where it's most convenient for you, at the very end of your life, he's so open to having a relationship with you that literally at the end of your life, we see the thief on the cross. He's at the very last moments of his life and he says, Jesus, you don't deserve to be up here. I do. I'm a sinner. He says, remember when, me when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. I'll see you on the other side, basically. He's so open and interested and, de and desirable 
to have a relationship with us that even until the last moment of your life, he's still desperately calling out your name. The problem is that many of us have strayed so far away from him that we can't hear him when he calls. You know, the blood of Jesus is your permission to draw near to God. The Bible says that we've been brought near to him, brought near to the Father by the blood of Jesus. And the main reason that people don't come near to God is not for a lack of permission. It's for a lack of ambition. It's a lack of desire. It's because there are other things that are more interesting to me right now. It's because I think there, there are other things that are more pleasurable that I could devote myself to. It's that I could get to that later. It's not a lack of permission. God is, he literally, the Bible says he never slumbers or sleeps. You could wake up at two in the morning, you don't have to call him and make sure that he's up and ask him for permission to hang out with you. He has given you all access, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for all of eternity, to full access in a relationship with him, to speak to him, for him to speak to you, for his presence to be felt and experienced by you. He'll, he'll show you things about the future. He'll, he'll do so many amazing things, but it's not for a lack of permission that we, that we ignore that that call, it's a lack of ambition. It's a lack of desire. And the reason that that lack of desire is there because people don't really know who God is. The reason many people don't want a relationship with God is because they don't know the God that wants a relationship with them. They've heard so many things about who God is. They've heard so many things about how God is, is this strict God, that he's a father that, that isn't going to forget my sin. He's just going to shake his head at me, that he's disappointed in me, that he's angry with me, that he that I really need to clean myself up before I come back to God because, you know, he doesn't want this. I'm too dirty. I'm filthy rags. But the Bible doesn't say that that's the way it works. We need to stop taking advice from the world about who God is because let me tell you something. The world hates God. Jesus said in the New Testament, he was looking to his followers and he said, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first. So don't be taking advice. Don't be taking hints from the world about who your God is. Why don't you let him introduce himself to you. Why don't you come and devote yourself to him and, and make appointments with him so that you can get to know him for yourself firsthand? Because until you do that, there's really no way that you're ever going to know God for who he really is. And he wants to be known. And that's a really powerful truth. And if everybody knew the truth of who God was, it would change. It would change everybody. Every, if, if everybody that didn't even believe in God right now knew who God was in a moment, they would come running to the altar. They'd come running with, with their tears streaming down their face, with their hearts bursted open because they realized just how loving, just how kind, just how compassionate, just how patient this father is, just how close this friend has made himself, just how available he is to us. If the world knew who he was, there would be no hesitation. There'd be no lack of ambition. There'd be no lack of devotion. There'd be no distance. And it's the same thing with us. We believe so many things about God that aren't true. And it's because of those reasons that we think we can't come to him openly. If we could have the worship team come up, that'd be awesome. I'm going to read this last couple of verses before we close. And in Exodus 19, verses 16 through 7, it says this. So it happened on the third day when it was morning. This is time. It's time for God to, make, to fulfill his appointment that he made with his people. On the third day when it was morning, that there were thunder and flashes of lightning and a thick cloud was on the mountain, and a very loud blast was sounded on a ram's horn so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood and presented themselves at the foot of the mountain. We're going to skip to the next chapter because there's a lot of stuff that goes on between there. The Ten Commandments are given. It's just not the focus for tonight. I just want to skip forward to this part that's really, really important for us to hear tonight. Exodus 20, 18 through 21. Now all the people witnessed the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the smoking mountain. And as they looked, the people were afraid and they trembled and they moved backwards and they stood at a safe distance. Then they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us or we'll die. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you. And in order that the fear of him that is a profound reverence for him and respect for him will remain with you so that you do not sin. So the people stood at a safe distance, safe to their comfortability, safe to their sin, but not safe to their soul. They stood at what they called a safe distance, but Moses approached. He drew near truth, the thick cloud where God was. In another translation, it says the thick darkness. In this cloud that was 
on the mountain. God had descended on this mountain with fire. Can you, can you imagine the sight that God from heaven descends on a mountain in the form of fire, so much so the entire mountain is engulfed in flames. There is smoke billowing up to the skies. There's thundering, there's lightning, and it's so powerful that, that the mountain is literally shaking violently. And the people are seeing this and they're like, I don't want to talk to that God. And I would probably say the same thing. And Moses says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid that God has come to, to condemn you or kill you. This is simply just so that your fear and respect of him would keep you away from sin because sin separates us from God and God doesn't want separation. God doesn't want distance. God wants relationship. God wants intimacy. And he says to draw near. God has given them permission to draw near. So they have an opportunity. And they say, no, I'm going to stand back at a distance. But Moses says, forget you guys. He drew near to the thick cloud, to the thick, deep darkness where God was. And you know, there are several times in my life that I found myself in thick darkness. And I find that many times in the darkness is where I feel and experience the presence and the, and the power of God the most. It's in the lonely times. It's in the times where I'm afraid. It's in the times where I'm confused, where I can't see where I'm going. It's in the times where, where I'm insecure, where I don't know what's going on in my heart, where I'm just confused and I'm, and I'm confounded and I'm just, I'm at war within myself and I don't like myself and, and, I, and I'm just in chaos. It's in those times, it's in the dark times that God sometimes feels the most close. Moses drew near into the darkness. And God is wanting to meet with many of us here in this place that are dwelling in a place of darkness in their life right now. I didn't discover the nearness of God in a place like this where I'm surrounded by other believers. The, the main points, the best times that I've ever had in my life are the moments that I've spent alone with God. Moments where I've sat on my bed feeling so lonely, feeling so depressed, feeling so ashamed and crying out to Him and Him coming and overwhelming me with this presence. It's the moments that I've spent alone with God that have transformed my life more than anything else. And I love coming to the church and I love experiencing and worshiping God with all of you. But there's nothing like spending time with him alone because intimacy happens in private. Experiencing his love for you and giving that love back to him, that's what this life is really all about. I'll end it with this story. There's a pastor named Pastor Francis Chan. And if you've never heard of him, I encourage you to look him up, look up some of his messages. I'm Sometimes I just listen to his messages and just cry because the way that he speaks, it's just, he's so anointed and the Holy Spirit is so on his words. So I'd encourage you guys to look him up. But I remember watching the sermon where he was telling this story. He was invited, it was Easter, and he was invited to a church to speak and it was a place that he had never been to before. And so he thought to himself, hey, I'll just, I'll flip through some of my old messages so that I don't have to study and prepare a new message. I'm just gonna go through and find one of the ones that I've done before so I don't have to spend all this time I'll pick like one of my best messages. And so he starts to flip through his old messages and he starts to read the things that he would say when it goes to like five, six, seven, eight, nine years in the past. And he starts to read the things that he would preach about and the way that he would talk. And he, he found himself, he was talking about how he found himself so amazed that he would say something like that, something so bold, something that really was a signal that he loved God. And, and he came across one sermon that he had written nine years earlier. He was reading about how he was talking about the, the birth of his son. And they went, the wife went into labor and they were on their way to the hospital and they're debating whether to bring their 10 year old daughter or not. And they ended up deciding, yes, we'll bring her. Okay, so they're on their way to the hospital. They get there and she's in labor and it's almost time for, for her to start pushing and the baby's almost born. And the doctor looks at his 10 year old daughter and he says, would you like to deliver your little brother? And she says, yes, and she starts to cry and they put gloves on her and they put goggles on her. And it's this intensely emotional, I've never had, you know, I've never had kids before. I've never witnessed that before, so I'm not sure. But I can imagine it is one of the most intense emotional experience of, experiences of a lifetime. And so he's watching there as his daughter, his 10-year-old little girl has these goggles and these little gloves on, and she's holding her hands out ready to catch her little brother. And it happens, and he's born, and everybody's crying. The daughter's crying. The father's crying. Mom's crying. The doctors are crying. The baby's crying. It's this, in, it's this incredible experience beyond words. And then he reads the next line of his message and he says this. He says, as amazing as that experience was, it pales in comparison to my times with Jesus this week. And he said that he came to a point where it pushed him off of a cliff. Where he told himself out loud, he said, 
I used to love Jesus more than I do right now. I used to give everything to him. I used to be so passionate about him. I used to talk to him like he was my best friend. I used to be so close to him. What happened? He had gotten so distracted by the things of this world, by criticism from other pastors and, and, and the issues that come with running a church and being a pastor and, and just being a human being in life. He had gotten so consumed that he had forgotten his first love. He had forgotten his relationship with Jesus. And he said something he never wanted to say. He said, I love Jesus then more than I do right now. And I believe that many people in this room are in the same place. There are times in our life where we get so distracted from what really matters. At the end of the day, at the end of our life, there's only going to be one thing that really matters. It's did you give your life to Jesus Christ? Did you have a relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ? And so anything that distracts us from that goal is nonsense. And what he said, it totally rings true in my heart. Some of the most incredible experiences in my life, they all pale in comparison to those moments where I'm alone with him where I'm sitting on my bed and I've just opened up my heart and I'm, I'm praying to him and I'm just so aware, God, that I'm in your presence and this is incredible and, and I can't believe that I'm here. I can't believe you're here. I, I can hear you speaking to me. I can feel your presence. This is amazing. I don't want to leave. Those are some of the most incredible experiences in my life. And as much as I love them, I know that God loved them so much more because of his intense love and devotion and desire to be with us. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask us a question tonight. God has already done his part. He's gotten rid of the distance created by sin. Nothing you have ever done, no place you've ever been, nothing that you've ever said can get in the way of what God wants to do in your life if you're willing to surrender. He's done his part. It's time for us to get rid of the distance created by a lack of devotion. And maybe you're in this room tonight and you've, you've been where Pastor Francis Chan was and you've been where I've been so many times in my life where I look back and say I used to love Jesus so much more than I do right now. If that's you in this place, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a few seconds and we're going to re-surrender and we're going to rededicate our life. But I know that there are other people in this room that, that probably have never given their life to Jesus fully. That they've never had those times alone with him where they've sought God and they've felt his presence and they've never really entered into a relationship with him. They've never surrendered control of their life. They've never had their sins forgiven. They've never secured their place in heaven, purchased for them by the blood of Jesus. They've never done that. And I know that there are people in this room, one of either side that I just described. And if that's you, if you've walked away, if you used to love Jesus more than you do right now, and maybe you've never given your life to him, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. I see your hands. Awesome. I'm going to ask one more time because this is a moment that we cannot let pass us by. If you are not 100% convinced that you are right with God, that you have a relationship with him, that your sins have been wiped away, washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Why don't you raise your hand one more time on the count of three. One, two, three. Awesome. You can put your hands down. What I want to do is everybody in this place right now, I want you to, to join with us as a family in God and repeat this prayer after me. And for those that are praying this prayer, pray it from your hearts, but realize that it's not the prayer that saves us. It's Jesus that saves us. So don't say it to me. Don't say it to you. Don't say it so that you can hear it. Say it so that Jesus can hear it. I promise you he's listening. He's leaned in right now because he is so excited and anxious to start this relationship with you or to rekindle this fire that you may have lost. So I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, I'm so sorry for allowing the things of this world to crowd you out of my life. I admit I'm a sinner. I need a savior. I ask you to forgive my sin, to cleanse me from the inside out, to make me a new creation. I accept your free gift of forgiveness and grace. And right now, I commit to, to begin a relationship with you where I don't surrender part of the way. But I give you everything from here on out. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Can we give these guys a round of applause? Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome.